Thank you very much. Balladu Buradri Gibi and Nadu Yindamali minds in Inagare, Niani Burgali Nura, Nina Yiradu. As a Buradri man, I bring greetings from my people, the Buradri people of New South Wales. I acknowledge the people on whose lands we meet today, and I ask that on this day, particularly as we come to speak about diversity and finding what is common amongst us, that we do meet together as one people. Ticking a box, what well, we all know about ticking a box, don't we, Aboriginal people? Every time we go to school, every time we seek a job, every time we join a sporting team, there is the box. At the bottom of every form, are you Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander? Well, I know that. But it is not enough for me to know that. It is asked of me that I declare that that I tell other people this is who I am. Not an individual choice of identity, but an expression of identity in public. Ticking a box puts you in a box. People define you according to that box. Now, for Aboriginal and Islander people, this is something we have sadly become so used to. If you go to the Australian Law Reform Commission, you will find 64 separate definitions of Aboriginal people. 64 times we have been defined and redefined. And we know this because we've lived this experience. A definition based on someone else's judgment. Who are you? What do you look like? Are you really Aboriginal? You can't be like the others. You're not like the others. You're too smart to be Aboriginal. You're too pretty to be Aboriginal. How many times have we heard this? I can see people nodding in the room because they've heard this too. This narrow definition of what it is to be an Aboriginal or Islander person. This taking of our own agency. Judgments that were made on the basis of appearance that separated families. To find one member of a family one way and another member another way, which meant that people could be taken from their homes, separated from their families, on the arbitrary judgment of an Aboriginal mission manager or a policeman or a welfare officer. We've all experienced this as well. The various subgroups of Indigenous people, the full blood, the half caste, the quarter caste, the octoroon, sometimes in the same family, based on whether you'd spent that morning at the swimming pool or not, and whether you're a shade darker than when you left home that morning. These are the things that have been used to define us. And it hasn't just been a definition for, for the purposes of grouping us or collecting data because remember for most of Australia's history up until the 1960s we weren't even counted amongst the rest of the population we weren't counted in the census no this was about deciding who we were for the purposes of destroying Aboriginal societies and communities we know that we know that this was the stated aim of policies like assimilation the absorption of the Aboriginal peoples into the Commonwealth. They were the words used at the basis of that policy. Absorption. That's why children were taken. That's why people were put onto reserves. That's why there were laws to tell you who you could marry, where you could live. Laws that excluded you from swimming pools and cinemas and from having a drink in a pub. This was about putting us in a box. How do we free ourselves and free our minds when we are constantly placed in a box? As I said, it is not about what I believe I am or what you may believe you are. It is about what other people want to tell you you are. And with that box comes a whole lot of assumptions. Assumptions about your capacity, assumptions about your capability, about your suitability. 
assumptions that lock you into the narrow confines of other people's low expectations, that Aboriginal people will not soar to the heights that others may enjoy. And if you don't believe this, have a look around. Look at our parliaments. Is there a premier? For the first time, we have an Aboriginal person leading a state or territory in the Northern Territory, Adam Giles. That's how long it took. For the first time, we have an Aboriginal person, Ken Wyatt, on the front bench of our federal parliament. The first time, more than 100 years after federation. No state premiers, no prime ministers. The treasurer of Australia has never been an Aboriginal person. We had an Armenian person in Joe Hockey, but we've never had an Aboriginal person. We've had Italians and Greeks. We've had Asian people. We've had others representing us at the highest level of government, but never an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person. The front bench of our high court, the high court that will decide the laws of this country that will hold, uphold our constitution. The High Court that made the Mabo decision, of course, which gave us the concept of native title, something we believed we had all along, mind you. It took them 200 years to find out what we already knew. But on the bench of the High Court, no Aboriginal person. Running our major hospitals, no Aboriginal person. Chief surgeon at a hospital, no. Head of any of our four major banks, no. Head of our major corporations, no. Because we're in the box. And today we come to talk about sport. Now we know the incredible achievements of Aboriginal people in sport, we know the names, boxing, Lionel Rose, the Mundine family, AFL, names like O'Loughlin and Winmar and Farmer and Long. The list is endless. We know the names, Rugby League, Arthur Beetson, Laurie Daly, Cliff Lyons, Greg Inglis, Jonathan Thurston, perhaps the single greatest player in the history of the game. Certainly the most decorated and awarded Aboriginal uh, player of, of any era, an Aboriginal man. When Lionel Rose came back from winning the world title in Japan, more people lined the streets to welcome him home than turned out for the Beatles. We know the names of our heroes. But where is an Aboriginal person running a football club? Where is an Aboriginal person coaching one of our major teams? Why are we not running the AFL or the NRL? Recently, there have been openings on the AFL Commission. There are people represented there from a whole broad spectrum of our community. Not one of us, not an Indigenous person, because we are in the box. This matters. Being put in a box matters. It limits us and it defines us. And we know, we know, don't we, where that comes from. It comes from the idea seeded at the heart of the Australian settlement that we were not human beings. And if we were to be accorded that much respect, it was only as the lowest, at the lowest rung of civilization's ladder. Go to the diary entries and the official records at the time of first settlement and you will see the way we are described. The fly-blown primitive savages bound for extinction. A people not worthy of the rights accorded to other people in other parts of the world. 1788, when Australia was settled, the idea of the inherent equality of all people was already alive in the world. The Declaration of Independence had been written in the United States. In that declaration, slaveholders 
people who kept other people in bondage were still able to concede this self-evident fact that all men, in the sexist language of the time, but we know what they were meaning, all men were created equal. Not here. This was an empty land, terra nullius, a land belonging to no one and a land for the taking. A people of 60,000 years at least occupation of this land, a people who had formed as this land formed itself, a people of the first footprints on this land, a people of law and culture, a people of politics and language and art and music, a people who had loved and lived for over 2,000 generations had no rights to this land. It is the fundamental grievance that still sits at the very heart of this country. 200 plus years later, we are still grappling with it. Terra nullius. The belief that we had no rights to this land. The box that we were put in. When Captain Arthur Phillip first established the settlement, the penal colony of New South Wales, he was instructed to make peace with the so-called natives. And there were attempts to do this. There was a moment when Australia could have been a very different country, when we shared our languages, we shared our cultures, but it was doomed not to last. Misunderstanding, disrespect, violence erupted within a matter of years and Captain Arthur Phillip, who'd been told to make peace with us, was ordering his soldiers to go out and bring back the severed heads of the so-called black troublemakers. Heads that were sent to England and to this day still sit in pickled jars, the heads of our people. By the 1820s, when they crossed the Blue Mountains, my people, the Wiradjuri people, were at war with the settlers. Now, we debate these things still. Was it war? Was it invasion? Was it settlement? At the time, there was no doubt. If you go to the Sydney Gazette, the newspaper, reporting these events. They reported these events as clearly as if we were reporting the wars of today of Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan. They described it as a war of extermination. Martial law was declared and my ancestors could be shot on sight. More than 50% of our population was destroyed. Within a matter of years, Windradine, the Wiradjuri chief, led our people on a march across the mountains into Parramatta to sit down with the governor and negotiate a settlement. He wore a hat and written on the brim of the hat was the word peace. This was a conflict. Within a matter of years, we were again being put in our box removed from our, our land, placed on missions and reserves where we were expected to simply vanish. By 1901, when Australia became a nation, when the colonies were federated and our constitution was written, the presumption was that we were a dying race. There was no place for us in our constitution We weren't counted amongst the Australian people. There was no reference to us save for laws that persist to this day, clauses in the Constitution that allow laws to be made 
that removed our children, trapped us on reserves and locked us out of education and employment. From the moment the Constitution of Australia was written, we were placed in our box. What an extraordinary thing it is that despite all of that, the frontier massacres, the missions and settlements, the generations of neglect and abuse, the poverty and disadvantage that crippled so many of our communities today, what an extraordinary thing it is that we could see what we saw here this morning. People expressing their culture and their pride, young children growing up proud of who they are. What an extraordinary thing it is that I can look out here and see Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people coming together in this room to make a commitment to a better country. What an extraordinary thing it is that our people, Aboriginal people, have been so forgiving have opened our hearts and our homes to you even when we were being told you weren't worthy of citizenship. I've seen it in my family, my grandfather who signed up to fight a war for this country when he was not yet counted as a citizen, to come home to a segregated country where he couldn't board the train in Sydney to go back to his home in full uniform, where he could not share a drink in a pub with the men he fought next to but never stop believing in a better country. We are Australia's greatest gift. Australia should be thankful for the resilience and the survival and the spirit of our people and the way that we still offer that to the country, the incredible generosity, the generosity that we saw this morning, those people coming and welcoming us to their country and sharing that with all of us. What an extraordinary thing. What an extraordinary thing it is that we can see Aboriginal people succeeding in sport to the extent that we do. And what an incredible thing it is that sport has provided that window that we can look through and imagine a better country that we can see black and white playing together in brotherhood and sisterhood, where we can see people coming together around community, when fans can put on their colours and go and cheer for a person who otherwise would have been locked out of this country. In sport, we hope that we find a way of breaking free of that box. In sport, we hope that we see a glimpse of our better selves, a glimpse of a better Australia. In sport, we imagine what we could be, the heroes in all of us. But I also wonder sometimes if that's just not a mirage. If for those moments when the ball is in play, we can suspend our belief, we can imagine the country is better than it really is. That's the only conclusion I could come to after the events of last year. In 2015, Australia turned to face itself again. In 2015, we met again, still across that divide of history. In 2015, on the sporting field, that place that we hold most sacred, that place that is the crucible of the Australian identity, we turned on an Aboriginal man. A voice in a crowd that taunted Adam Goods as an ape grew into a crescendo of booze that echoed from one football ground to another. One voice became the voices of thousands of people. Here was a man who believed in the best of Australia. Here was a man whose mother was taken from her family, put into that box that said Aboriginal people were not good enough and you needed to be bred out. Here was a man whose resilience and courage and determination lifted himself above a childhood 
of dislocation and poverty, a nomadic childhood of moving from town to town, a childhood of broken families. He was a man who reached the absolute top of his field. A man not just judged one of the great players of this time, but one of the great players of all time. A dual Brownlow medalist. A premiership winner. A leader of men. Not just an Australian, an Australian of the year. And this man was forced to leave the field because of the humiliation the chorus of condemnation that told him, you're not one of us, get back in your box. Adam Goods could not even attend the AFL Grand Final. Think of that. Think of the hurt that that man must have felt that he could not face another crowd. That was Australia 2015. There are those who made excuses and there are those who tried to say this was not about racism, but we knew. We in the box knew. I wrote an article at the time saying I could not speak to what is in the minds and the hearts of the people who booed Adam Goods, but I could speak to what we heard. And we heard a howl of humiliation that echoed across 200 years plus of dispossession and suffering and injustice, the howl of stolen children, the howl of beheaded bodies, the howl of mothers torn from their families, the howl of fathers who could not work to feed their families, the howl of people locked up on reserves with every aspect of their life controlled. That's what the booing of Adam Good said to us. It was a howl. And anyone who imagined otherwise, anyone who excused that behaviour, had no idea who we were as a people because they had not been in our box. If we take the Adam Goods booing, if we take our history of neglect and suffering, we could so easily condemn this country. But we know that's not the full story. I know that's not the full story because I look out here today and I see people who tell me that is not who we are. I have seen people stand with us to say, no, Australia is better than this. I have seen people who stood with us in the 1930s when we began to agitate for citizenship. The people who voted in the 1967 referendum to acknowledge our full belonging to this country, to count us among them the people who got on buses to protest with us against segregation, the people who marched for reconciliation right across the country, the people who shed tears with us when Kevin Rudd delivered the apology to the stolen generations. All of those people have said, no, we are a much better country than that. If we believed the worst of us, we'd be condemned to repeat the worst of us. But we are not that. I can't believe that. No one here in this room can believe that. We're going to be asked potentially again soon to think again about what it is to be an Australian, to what it is to undo the darkness of our past, to shine a light into who we should really be, to fill in the missing gaps of our constitution, to acknowledge that we are not a people who vanished, who were doomed for extinction. There is a movement now to recognise Indigenous people in the constitution. We don't know what that will mean yet. 
not even sure if that is going to be a successful movement. But it is an opportunity to start asking us what it is to be an Australian. For non-Indigenous people, how do you connect, not to 200 plus years of history, but to 60,000 years of tradition? What it is to walk on a land with the first footprints first emerged in that darkness of time, people who made the first journey across the seas, anywhere on earth, to find a home here, to walk in those first footprints. That is your challenge. Our challenge, Aboriginal people, is to say, where do we belong? Are we always going to sit on the margins? Are we going to be outside of Australia? Are we going to continue to identify ourselves around a history of loss and suffering and grievance and misery? Or are we going to imagine a better future for ourselves? Are we going to accept the full responsibility and challenge of our citizenship of this country? Are we going to draw a line in the sand too and reconcile with the people who otherwise would have harmed us? Are we prepared to do that? I think we are. I think we are a people who are prepared to look to the future and not look to the past. We need to free ourselves from the bonds of our own history. We need to free ourselves from the narrow definitions of what it is to be an Aboriginal person. We need to free ourselves from that box, the box that our own people, and we know this, put us in as well. People who tell you that Success is not being black. Who do you think you are? Oh, you're acting white now. We've all heard that. Success is being black. Being proud of yourself. Being able to say, I am as smart as anyone else. I will work as hard as anyone else. I'm as talented as anyone else. And I deserve the full recognition of that talent. And nothing should impede my full aspirations and the realisation of my ambitions. And anyone, black or white, who tries to hold you back is not a patriot of this country and is no friend of ours. We Aboriginal people too, we need to say, we are a part of this country, we belong in this country, we will contribute to this country, we will preserve our unique status, our culture and identity to share with the rest of this country, but we will not live lives of loss and suffering and victimhood on the margins anymore. We need to have this conversation now. What political form this has given, what changes to the constitution, what form of recognition, what treaties may be signed, all of this is to be worked out. But unless we actually come together and know what our destination is, what we are prepared to, to relinquish in order to build a nation, if we, are, if we can't do that, then we are nowhere. We had that moment last year with Adam Goods that made us ask those questions. We cannot allow this moment to pass. In 2000, Australia had its greatest sporting moment. I stood in the stands as the eyes of the world were upon us. I stood in the stands as I saw the flags of all nations enter the arena. I saw Australians holding their flag aloft and singing their anthem with pride. And it was a dark, dark moment of the soul for me. I stood there feeling so alone and so estranged from this country. There was a hole where my country should have been. I looked at those flags and I didn't see my flag. I heard that anthem and I didn't hear the story of my people. For we are young and free. Australia's not young, it's 60,000 years old and our people aren't free. We are locked up more than any other people in this country. I stood there and I wondered, how is it that in a country as remarkable as Australia, we can still feel as if we don't belong, as if we were in this box? I looked out and there was an Aboriginal woman at the centre of this incredible ceremony. Kathy Freeman lighting the torch for the rest of the world. 
a woman who had struggled with her own sense of belonging, a woman whose grandmother had been taken from her family, a woman who had seen her father die young. A few nights later, that same woman ran that remarkable race with the pressure of Australia and the weight of all expectation on her shoulders and carrying with her the dreams of her people. She won that gold medal, collapsed to the ground and then rose again to carry our flag. We were there. And an Australian flag, together, a symbol of what this country could be. And written on Kathy Freeman's body were three words. Cause I'm free. Free of the history. Free of the low expectations of others. Free of being put in that box. We can all be free of that box. We can all be free in a new Australia. But it is not going to happen without effort. It is not going to happen without asking who we can be to really make ourselves free. Thank you again. <laughs>